Huh. No, I swear I'm sitting down because I hope you're not seeing what I see on my screen. Uh, man, I'm not even real sure uh, where I want to start today. But uh, I've been reading through Mark. I wanted to focus some more on the Gospels. God was giving me a reprieve from First John so I can let some of the, uh, the love just kind of be there in the back of my mind without overdosing on it at first. And uh, just so I can get a, a refreshed picture of who Jesus really was when he walked around when he was on this planet. And, uh, man, one of the things, I just started reading the book of Mark last night, and I've read, I, I've read the Bible a couple times before, but, uh, you know, I always just kind of kind of glean something new out of it every time. And what really struck me last night, and then again today when I was reading through it, was uh, just how... Mm -hmm. How much of a uh, how much uh, almost of an anti-hero Jesus was like man even just in Mark he was <laughs> he, he would try and get away from people and uh, yeah like. Man, he would he would just try and steal away from these crowds, and then they would just find him, or somebody would get their healing. Like the uh, somebody would just be delivered of whatever was bothering them, and then he would strictly tell them, "Dude, don't say anything about this, man. You just go pay your penance to the temple, like what Moses said, and live your life." And then, of course, they just couldn't shut up. And then, the, I mean, that was it was all through that book in particular, much less. The other three, and uh, I mean, that was just something that really, really struck me, because he always focused more on teaching. That was where his heart was, and I mean, he, when he got a chance, man, he would he would teach people. And when he was going from place to place, that's when they would just mob him, and. Uh, Man, that was when he had to do his miracles, because the Bible still said he had compassion on people. Like when he was trying to just get across the sea to this other town, and then people from like eight towns overheard, and they all just shot to that other side of the lake where he was going, and just waited for him. Very, very great multitude. And man, it says he had compassion on him, and he spent some time with him. But the time he spent with them didn't involve gimmicky garbage. Like, uh, you know, quarters being glued to the wall by spiritual ectoplasm or whatever. You know, have you heard of that crap? And gems appear in people's pockets. I don't even know what it is now. Honestly, I just hear it secondhand. I don't even bother <laughs> with it with keeping up on the on the trends because it's just depressing. So I let the uh, more strong-willed, I guess, I let them deal with it and and, uh, and pass it along to me. Like uh, Pam and Bernard, they're pretty good about keeping up on that stuff. And then they just, they, they keep me abreast on it while we make a bunch of jokes. <laughs> But, man, none of that really was what Jesus was about. And he chastised people that were about it. You know, I mean, not about the... Uh, not about the fancy gimmicks, but just about the people whose hearts were not forgotten, such as the 
church people, the religious people of that day, the church leaders. And, uh, you know, I've just been really trying to get a, uh, a more solid grasp on who Jesus is because if revival is really going to happen, it's going to happen from people that look like Jesus and not from people that spend all week whining and doing their thing. And then, you know, maybe, maybe two days out of the week, feel remorseful about it and try and get their life back on track. And then never really make any progress in overcoming themselves. You know, I mean, I, and there are so many references just in Mark about Jesus just trying to have some quiet time and just rest. And then these people just keep coming. And that's how his fame spread, man, was these miracles that he was doing because of the compassion he had for these people. Not because he was trying to build his own ministry. There was one guy in particular he healed, and he didn't tell him to be quiet about what happened. Jesus told this guy, man, hey, go back where you came from, man, and tell him, every single one of them what the Lord has done for you. Tell him what God did. Absolutely no mention of Jesus because he was about his father's business. And you notice how it never really went to his head. As soon as, the, uh, as, soon as he started kicking up some dirt, making a name for himself with all those miracles that God was doing through him, he was ready to move on to the next town where he could be a little more discreet, where people weren't so interested in the gifts as much as they were about the teaching. <laughs> <laughs> of course, he that was few and far between. You know, I'm thinking about it too, another little nugget when I was reading Mark today. Was uh, had a hard time figuring out who all those people were that came and lynched him in the garden there at the, at the end. And because uh, I always got tickled when. <sighs> <laughs> when Jesus, like in, in Mark at least, it says he went into the temple one night and just kind of checked it out, sized things up, you know, observed. And then he went back out of town and he went to sleep. Next morning he came in, drove every single one of those, the money changers, the buyers, sellers, drove all of them out to the point where nobody could even carry wares through the temple. And after he got those money grubbers out of the way, it was a little more open. He had a chance to teach to whoever may have wanted to come in and actually listen instead of just uh, see miracles. And I just got to thinking, man, this a very great multitude came with, you know, lanterns and pitchforks or whatever. And it took Judas Iscariot pointing out Jesus for them to figure out who he was. Then I started wondering if it was all those people that got driven out of the marketplace whose livelihood Jesus interrupted because they had no sanctity or respect for God. You know, something I was thinking about. Still thinking about it. But anyway, you ever just notice... You ever just notice when uh, these people just kept thronging Jesus and it didn't phase him? He was so single-minded and single-focused that humility wasn't a problem. Man, then I started gauging myself up to that standard <laughs> and realized that uh, maybe... Maybe God's got a reason for not dumping out all of his goodness on me just yet. <laughs> but isn't that what we're striving for, man? Just to be, to follow in the footprints of Jesus. Not that stupid footprints poem or story or what the, the little feel-good narrative. 
you know, where there was only one set of footprints and I carried you some, or, you know, whatever it is. It's been a while since I read it. But aren't we supposed to identify with Jesus and with God and all with ourselves and with our past and with the aspirations that we have developed or brought to fruition in our own lives, especially if they've got nothing to do with God, man. I mean, you know, yeah, not every single one of us is going to go around traveling in a circuit around all these towns teaching and preaching and, and healing and doing all these miracles. But I don't recall to be so singularly focused on what God's having us do that we almost forget who we are. Like, man, to the point where it's not even about us. It's, man, if somebody's in the way of us doing the work of God, what is the most loving way we can step over them and get them out of the way? But, man, you just study how Jesus lived. You start comparing that to a lot of mainstream preachers now. There was one guy, <laughs> I never would have believed it. He started talking all spiritual and busted out the southern accent and about how God wants to bless you. You know, the whole silver-tongued snake oil salesman or whatever they're called. And he, he barged out into the crowd off stage while he's being filmed. And you know, I mean, he's talking about the importance of giving or well, giving to him. <laughs> he, he never skipped a beat when he was talking. Picked up this lady's purse, started rummaging through it, opened the wallet, and took money out, and said it was the work of God. And this chick was just so hypnotized by it that I mean, she was just looking up with that little childlike grin. She said, oh, he's paying attention to me, and you know that. Uh, wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen the clip myself. <laughs> Man, sometimes I watch Christian TV just to feel better about the video stuff that I've done. <laughs> you know, praise God if it helps somebody. But there was, uh, that was one time. I was getting pretty worked up when I was watching Christian TV just for, you know, boosting my own self-esteem. <laughs> you call it unhealthy or not, it's just something I was doing a while back. And, uh, you know, then the, the time came, you have your chance to give, even though the phone number's at the bottom of the screen for the entire telethon. And, uh, man, I just, I couldn't take it anymore. I called them up. And uh, I was just going to give him the one for her. It's like, just, you know, there's the, whoever answered the phone, the operator. And, you know, in, in a loving Christian way, of course. But I called him up, man. I was just ready to just unload all this doctrine on him. So this operator answered, man. It was just a really genuinely nice, happy, older woman, you could tell she had some age in her voice. And you could tell she genuinely believed in what she was doing. And that just disarmed me. <laughs> I don't even know what I said to get out of that weird situation. But uh, <laughs> I, uh, I did not bring down fire from heaven across the phone. <laughs> Man, I was just kind of taken aback at just how deceived some of those people are, man. Sure, they're doing it for God, man. There's a lot of things I did at this one church and I still live in Washington. I did it thinking I was helping God, and yeah, the best of my knowledge, I was. Of course, at the same time, I was also handicapping God because of what that church was teaching. And, uh, when, uh, when the blinders came off, the uh, the church decided they didn't want my help anymore. <laughs> Makes you wonder how much of God was really in that church, huh? 
<sighs> but really, man, uh, why are these people spending so much time talking about themselves if they are not trying to be a gateway to Jesus? If they're not trying to be an encouragement to you? If they're just trying to extort money from you? <laughs> or... You know, find the fancy new Christian gimmick or the new spiritual gimmick that the devil can use just to distract people from God. You ever notice God likes the simple life? Not to say he likes the poor life, it's just the simple life. And I was, uh, there was one guy at a, a, the prayer center conference maybe two or three years ago now, Gary Carpenter had, had this guy come up and he was an entrepreneur. And this guy was talking about how God told him to buy, to buy stock of Ford Motor, Motor Corporation when it was under $1.50 a share, I think it was. $1.50 or buck twenty-five, something like that. And uh, so then this guy's like, oh, all right, yeah, I can do that. That's, oh, that surely that was God. I heard it in my prayer time. And uh, and then I guess 2008 came around the recession here in the states, and uh, everything tanked. So, sure enough, the stock got just underneath that threshold God set for this guy. This guy waited a little longer, a little longer. And I don't remember if he ended up doubting himself or or what. He said, and then Ford turned themselves around. Now their stock is up around 30, 40 bucks a share. I forget what it was at the time. And uh, he ended up not buying (laughs) any of it. And I was like, well, you know, that sucks. But maybe he only had like 500, maybe 1,000 bucks to invest because you know how Christian entrepreneurs are. And he's like, well, yeah, you know, I had about 20 grand I could have put into it. I'm pretty sure that guy heard God <laughs> about when to buy Ford stock. And uh, pretty sure he didn't hear God on the actual undertaking of buying Ford stock. But, you know, when crunch time comes, it's a little easy to uh, back out. But where in the Gospels do you see Jesus manifesting gemstones? in people's pockets, raining down clouds of gold dust over these throngs of people. What do you do? And he freed them from demonic influence. He fed them with the loaves and the fishies, and he taught them. I don't think that was the priorities that he wanted. But, hey, you got to start with what you've got, don't you? <laughs> That's what Jesus did. But where is our identity, man? It, I've really, really been uh, putting myself over the coals with with just comparing myself to Jesus and seeing just how much I'm left wanting. Not in a bad way, you know. I'm not like an emotional masochist or something. But we got to be honest with ourselves, especially if we're trying to get to the point where Jesus was and miracles weren't no thing to him. So we got to (laughs) wonder, how humble are we really, man? If we got great multitudes, could be 10, 15,000 people, just hanging on our every word, ready to do whatever for us, are they going to influence our decision to move on? Or are we going to set up camp right there and, uh, you know, maybe a TV ministry, maybe a little bit of uh, emotional extortion for having God bless you by giving to this ministry and uh, just keep 
growing and growing and growing and growing outward instead of growing up. Man, it, you could say Jesus' ministry was pretty big, but then you can also see it was just a bunch of regular folks, well, mostly regular, that tagged along and funded him. I mean, yeah, there was the wife of Herod Stewart that chipped in, but, you know, I mean, then there was that prostitute and I just, the, the Marys. How big do we need to get, man? How big was Paul's ministry? He just prayed and uh, got beat up and wrote letters <laughs> and made tents and taught people when he was not in prison and sometimes when he wasn't in prison. But really, man, how serious are we about revival, about giving Jesus a, a place to come back to? <laughs> The uh, man, the one verse that did keep coming up and coming up was uh, Luke twenty one nineteen, and the whole context is he's uh, it was after the widow's mite, and then he's walking through the temple, and then he's talking about the end times and these signs and everything, and then like how all this bad stuff's going to happen to to Christians, and then he said, but. Don't worry, you'll be cool. Hair on your head don't have to get hurt. By your patience, possess your souls. And that, that's a verse that stuck with me for just years now, man. It was the one that jumped out at me out of the whole book of Luke when I was reading it before. By your patience, possess your souls. You know, Jesus didn't have his soul under subjection. <laughs> man, that thing knew its place that was as sanctified as you can get it without being in heaven look at that man look at how Jesus reacted to some of these people <laughs> especially dude, the uh, the whole crucifixion part of the gospels man it always throws me out of whack every single time even after Words when it's all happy and upbeat at the end when he pops out of the tomb and you know the whole Jesus Christ superstar singing dance number. Man, he still got the whole the crucifixion. Man, what he must have gone through. That always shakes me up. And I just got done reading that about 15 minutes before we started this. <laughs> but is it a fair question to ask ourselves, as unbiased as possible, how much of our soul we possessed? I mean, just how much of ourselves we've actually given to God? And not the stupid church talk where we can all be puffed up, build ourselves up, a big game and everything. When it's just you and God, just me and God, and uh, we know that we ain't got nothing we can hide. Because God calls us out on it right away. <laughs> There's one thing that he is not shy about. And he don't care about our pride. Man, when Jesus was on trial and all these people were going and, uh, and lying about him up on the witness stand, and he just stood there, man, and he was just absolutely silent to the point <laughs> where, where you could see it was getting on the nerves of the priests. Like, how come you're not saying anything? <laughs> so finally, they had to resort to using the Bible to, uh, to get him to say something. You know, did you say you're the Christ? And then that was when he finally started talking. <laughs> Even Pilate was impressed by his ability to not talk. <laughs> and if I put myself up on a stand like that, I don't think I would have that same kind of self-control, to be honest. Especially if uh, I was able to operate so fluidly in word of wisdom, word of knowledge, 
like Jesus could have. Man, you just exposed some dirt on those high priests. It's all over. <laughs> but he knew his purpose, man, and he was a lot more full of love. <laughs> Oh, man. I don't know about you, but I still got a ways to go. But, really, man, the biggest question I think any of us can ask is, how serious are we about revival? About having a church for Jesus to come back to? I look at how I've been spending my time. Ah. <laughs> uh, we can go a lot of directions with that, but we'll just say that uh, I have not been patiently possessing my soul as efficiently as I could. My life has not been, wait, no. My life has been more of my own than his. Man, <laughs> if the truth doesn't hurt sometimes, how do you know what to patch up? <laughs> <laughs> makes it a lot easier to, to swallow though when it's God when God's the one that's telling you about it doesn't it you know he's got the, uh, he's got a spoonful of sugar with it and that's one thing really man just me in particular has been needing to work on he's been talking to me a lot mostly just yesterday about my sister because she had some bad experiences with church people and uh, so then she got swayed into Wicca I got some things to say about some of the people that welcomed her into that but that would also not be in love <laughs> and I'm still entertaining the thought so you know how much more praying I have to do but what he was telling me was uh, he just kind of unloaded on me, so I will, uh, I'm still digesting it, so I will uh, regurgitate it as fluidly as I can. That was a disgusting image. Anyway, uh, man, just being more patient and more loving with her, because I, I compete with myself a lot. And then sometimes that overflows into those same expecting those same standards from other people, and uh, that that passion and that intensity has uh, actually <laughs> managed to get me fired a couple times. <laughs> but that's all in the past, you know. You know so <laughs> whatever. <clears throat> but. Uh, you know, that uh, that kind of thing is not what's contagious. <laughs> that comes after you get a hold of the truth and it gets roots in you, man. You start seeing who God really is. You start pondering on that, meditating on it, on, on God, man, and how much He wants for you and how good He is and how much He loves you and how much He can do for you if you just let Him. But you know, that doesn't happen by pointing out people's faults. <laughs> you know how many times I've had to learn that? <laughs> He's been really encouraging me to uh, try a different approach with people, particularly my sister, because uh, God knows she needs it. <laughs> and man, I... Uh, Just to give you an idea of our interactions over the last couple of years, mine and hers, I didn't really agree with her choice in a husband. <laughs> and, uh, you know, maybe it'll turn out all right, whatever, but I felt like I should say my piece. You know, I don't want the blood on my hands. So I just flat out had uh, a couple of real blunt conversations with her about how about my opinion of him <laughs> we'll leave it at that and uh he was kind enough to validate my opinion with his actions 
if you want to put it that way. But naturally, that caused a rift between me and her. And there was another time before that. I was, she just has all these emotional crap quotes, you know, where she got the nice serene, you got the beach and the sand and the shore and the sunset and the lone tree and then an inspirational quote hanging over it. And uh, she was spreading that around and uh, the quote was, uh, depression isn't a sign of weakness. It's a sign that you've been strong for too long. And man, by that time, I, I was, I was on the brink anyway. Dude. I was just waiting for one more opportunity to have a reason to just jump on it. And uh, so, of course, I jumped on it. I was like, no, depression's a sign that you gave up because you don't want more out of life, and you don't think it's worth trying. And then one of these friends slash mentors of hers that has been instrumental in her current lifestyle beliefs she started telling me about how depression is permanent you can't do anything about it blah 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 so of course then i jumped on her because uh, <laughs> i don't think any of my family likes her except my sister <laughs> i heard stories about when uh, my daddy go toe to toe with her just about uh, just science and stuff and this uh, <laughs> anyway so of course then uh, you know I don't want I don't know what my sister and her friend ended up saying but uh, my sister ended up taking this friend's side because of course I presented the truth in a uh, harsh and very pointed manner because that's how I like it and then cut to the chase turns out that's uh, that's not a contagious attitude either <laughs> but man we didn't talk for uh, I think about a year after that, that happened. My folks were up here one January, and uh, I don't think my sister and I said much of anything to each other. And then my mom came up the next January, and of course she was sending me on all these guilt trips. Not doing it out of uh, not because she's a church person, just because she wants her family to get along. <laughs> So, of course, by then, I think she had cooled off, and um, I guess I had toned back some, put a little bit of a bridle in the mouth. So we got that out of the way, and then I started saying my piece about her husband, and that fell through, and, ah, uh, man. There's going to be a lot, a lot of needy, emotional, hopeless, insecure, directionless people that are going to come out of the woodwork as soon as they see some flicker of hope, some, some flash of a chance that maybe there's something that we have that can help them straighten their life out and get them back on track. Whether it's God being able to push a vertebrae back into somebody's spine or straightening out their whole back or you know, growing a leg out, opening up an ear or an eye or whatever, man. Are we going to deal with them uh, by calling them a milk toast tool and blaming the whole influx of burdensome Christianity on people like that? <laughs> or are we going to have enough love and humility and patience to just accept them and piece by piece, crumb by crumb by crumb, give them the hope they need, man, let them take it a bite at a time, a morsel at a time, just a sliver, a crumb at a time. God ain't in a hurry. Because he knows the nature of people. Do we have the kind of patience and love and humility and altruism 
to deal with the people that are just going to need and need and need and need and need and not leave you alone and hound you and stalk you and follow you everywhere and not give you a moment's rest because you have something that they have found will give them hope to, to lead a life, to be alive. It's going to be between you and God to develop that in yourself, just like it's between me and God to develop it in myself. It's not something you're going to get out of church. Man, it's a relationship solely between you and God. Now, how many people do you think Jesus could have full, complete, pure, total fellowship with when he was on this earth? <sighs> you think he got a little lonely? Why well, do you think he spent so much time in prayer? <laughs> Ah. Anyway, man, I... <sighs> leave you with that, I guess. Some to uh, think about, because it's up to each of us individually to do our part for revival. It's not about us listening to messages about revival and how good it's going to be and what it's going to be like. Hallelujah! Praise God. It's up to us to make it, man, to give God a place for it to happen. And the biggest hindrance, dude, <laughs> he can't even trust us enough to flow through us to do what he wants to do. Whose fault is that but our own? So, finally, my brethren, peace be with you and also with you. Hope you had a good week. Hope you had a good week coming up, man. Love you guys. Hope to hear from you soon. See you soon. Bye.